Welcome, heathens and witches, to the latest episode of the Horn and Cauldron Podcast. Podcast. Yeah. So, uh, we are doing it on Ostara this time around, since it right. is the season for Ostara. So, uh, take it away. Yeah. And if you're listening to this uh, when it airs or close to it, then um, you'll be listening to it just before Ostara. So maybe you can use some of these uh, tips and knowledge tricks. bits uh, and even some spells that we got put together for your Ostara celebrations. Yeah. So, uh, also, since you are listening to this uh, at all, if you're listening to this on a podcast platform of your choosing, then uh, please subscribe to this. We have these come out every other week. Um, if you want to comment specifically on this, these are also posted as videos, so you can see our stupid faces on YouTube. <laughs> and uh, uh, so comment there. And if you are watching this on YouTube, don't forget to like this video, comment below, share, subscribe, uh, ring the bell, do all that kind of stuff. And uh, hit us up on Patreon, no matter what you're doing. Uh, everything we talk about is gonna have a Book of Shadows page. We have a yeah. Book of Shadows on our Patreon now. So I just got done with the Aphrodite one as of um, like a couple of days before recording this. And then we have one on tarot that I'm working on right now, which is from uh, the last episode or two episodes ago, something to that yep. extent. And then we have this Ostara one. So it generally, it'll take like about a week for the Book of Shadows page to come out. But, um, you know, they're, they're pretty highly graphic. They're fun. I don't, I didn't, I don't know where I put the co uh, version or I'd hold it up for those in the YouTube, oh, but um, right. maybe I'll maybe I'll put uh, like a little clip of the of the thing in post. Yeah, we'll see how I feel about that. But yeah, so check that out. Hit us up on Patreon. Um, you know, support us in doing these podcasts. We all we do all of this stuff for fun. Mm -hmm. So um, all this research and all the graphic design. We also have um, like. Uh, cell phone wallpapers for the podcast. Um, I, well, you can't see it on my cell phone, but I have like wallpaper, uh, cell phone wallpapers for the podcast. So you'll, each episode will also have an, uh, an associated wallpaper mm -hmm. to go with it. Uh, so I have, uh, again, I have the Aphrodite wallpaper and I have our Horn and Cauldron, uh, wallpaper. And, uh, if you've noticed a change in our, uh, main graphic label, uh, like cover art or label art. That's because we just updated it to fit with the theme of all the rest of our stuff. That's right. Um, it so looks I've been, really nice. I've been doing a bunch of graphic work on that. So hit me up. Uh, we uh, will have buttons and stickers and all that kind of stuff. I'm literally like in the process of designing all that. So a bunch of stuff yeah. coming. So uh, join us and be witchy with us and uh, and uh, you know get get education at the same time because we're. Gonna make an Ostara Book of Shadows page. Most of these pages are most of these are about two pages for each podcast. Uh -huh. So um, yeah, you'll get that. You'll get to get that and uh, download those and have a good time with them. Yeah. So and not only do those uh, Book of Shadows pages have information from the podcast, so you don't have to like you know try to remember all this stuff or like take notes. Do people take notes when they listen to podcasts? I have no clue. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I normally working um, when I listen to a but... podcast, but that's whatever. <laughs> but they also have any spells that we talk about mm -hmm. in the podcast mm -hmm. as well as the full list of correspondences yes which is something that we don't um we don't even read the full list generally <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> and uh if long. if it's desired and if it becomes a thing we may do a uh larger uh like a like a secondary book for the book of shadows in the on our patreon which is just like correspondences and herbs and their uses and make it cross-referenceable like make a big data file that we can all sort of share around that's right and do that so i'm i'm working on how to do that um in a way that lets us update it um and uh lets us also uh sort of like oversight the information so that way when there is a change or new information or or we find some mm -hmm. other connection that we didn't know about we can add it or so, add a new thing yeah so that's 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 in the works if you have an idea on how to do that then hit me up also so yeah we've yeah. talked i've talked long enough about all the projects that are at hand so let's um, <laughs> can you tell we're busy let's os this tara y'all all right we'll get into it 
So uh, Ostara, otherwise known as the vernal or spring equinox, is uh, the beginning of astronomical spring. It's also the beginning of the astrological calendar. So um, any Aries babies out there, it's your time to shine, or at least it will be shortly. Uh, and uh, Ostara takes place on... Um, it's somewhere between March 19th and March 21st of every year. Um, it's the spring equinox for us in the Northern Hemisphere. In the Southern Hemisphere, it's the fall. Um, it's the beginning of fall for them. And uh, really, equinox just means equal suns. So on that day, the uh, time of, like the amount of time during the day is equal to the amount of time during the night, uh, which is really cool. And each day after that, up until the summer solstice or midsummer uh, in June, each day gets longer. Each morning starts a little earlier. Each day goes a little bit later. So that's uh, pretty exciting. Um, and cultures throughout the world have celebrated the spring equinox in a variety of ways. And um, there's tons and tons and tons of places and I could not begin to name them all on here. I'd have to go much more in depth than we typically go in this podcast for that, even though we go pretty in depth on some things. But the one that is the oldest celebration that is still concurrently being celebrated, so it never stopped being celebrated, is uh, actually in Egypt. And it is Shal, Sham El Enesam. And if I pronounce that wrong and you happen to know, please let me know what the right pronunciation is. Please correct me. I just listened to a little YouTube video that told me how to pronounce that and they could be wrong. That's fair. Yeah. Uh, and that has been celebrated as far back as 2700 BCE. So that has been celebrated for like 4,000 years in Egypt. They've celebrated the spring equinox, which is pretty cool. And it's not actually a religious festival either. Um, on this day, it's really common for uh, people to head out to parks and gardens and zoos, just sort of being outside, taking in the nature with their family. And they typically enjoy a picnic meal that includes uh, salted fish, onions, and eggs. And that sounds fantastic. I want... I want some of that in my life. Yeah. <laughs> so much like in bulk, um, primarily the, the, origins of Ostara that we know about, um, are related to the patron, uh, goddess of this particular holiday. Uh, so for in bulk, that's Brigid and for, um, Yoster that is, or for Easter for Ostara, that's Yoster. Really? All these words that sound like almost the same. It's killing me. Um, <laughs> the word itself is derived from an old high Germanic word meaning dawn, which indicates that the word came into being between the 8th and 11th century because Old High German was spoken during that time frame. Uh, and that actually falls pretty much in line with the birth of a lot of words for the other pagan holidays that we've talked about on this podcast. So, um... We can only work Imbolc, with the history that we have, Yule, guys. That's right. You know? Um, but in 1958, over 150 inscriptions were found on objects called the Matronae Austriahanae. Um, and these inscriptions and the um, things that they were inscribed on date back to the second century. And they actually had a variation of names for the word Eoster on there too. So that's actually really cool. That's much further back than we typically see with this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And that sort of revolutionizes the conversation about it. Um, now, these matronae Osterhenae uh, are typically found in northwestern Europe, but they've been found as far south as Italy. And they are essentially altar displays or altars themselves, depending on how particular they, people got about them. And they are carved. Um, and on these, it is three figures. It's always three figures. They are always all women. And they are either goddesses or they are um, ancestors. And they're sort of used as little just like ritual altar decorations asking for the wisdom and the strength and protection of the um, ancestors they have a lot of similar themes across them as well a lot of them have like 
one of them holding a bowl of fruit and one of them holding bread. And sometimes they have a pig or other livestock there to help um, simulate the idea that these bring abundance. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, which is actually really interesting. I had never heard of this before. And now I'm just like, oh, so that's a thing that I'm going to need to do. <laughs> and these um, these little sculptures, they really reinforce something that we've talked about in previous podcasts, which is this like ancient triple goddess concept. The same thing that we saw with Brigid, the mm -hmm. same thing that we see with Hecate, mm -hmm. the same thing that we see with several goddesses in the Greek pantheon. We sort of see that, that rule of three thing going backwards in time and seeing how that goes. So um, it, and there are a lot of other goddesses that have this sort of triple aspect throughout the world it's not just the western cultures that have this mm -hmm. that's sort of a theme uh, worldwide with certain goddesses and um it's really cool because it helps to sort of reinforce that now um prior to 1958 scholars debated as to whether this monk who lived in the from 673 to 735 just made up eoster so this monk's name was Bede, uh, or Beatty. I'm actually not sure how you pronounce it. So if you know, let us know. I would like to be corrected if I said it wrong. So uh, Bede is uh, a monk. He lived from 673 to 735, common era, which is around the same time that we have like the oldest sort of mentions of uh, Ostara, of Eoster in uh, documentation. And um, he's widely credited as being the person who made the term AD, uh, Anno Domini, you know, anything before the year zero. He didn't actually create or invent that term, but he's the one who's credited as popularizing it, which is interesting. Hmm. Uh, he also, unrelated to this, wrote a book about how the round earth influenced the seasons and the moon influenced the tides. So this guy was probably <laughs> from, he was probably from now times and then like, <laughs> um, got stuck back in time is what that well sounds like to me been. is that this dude was just like from right now and he got thrown backwards in time <laughs> and he was just like, no, you guys got to start saying Anno Domine. Just the, the way that you're counting is dumb. Yeah. He's basically you know? like middle, middle ages, Elon Musk, yeah. because we think Elon Musk he was is just from the, from the future. He was just from the future. Listen, occasionally <laughs> some dudes come backwards in time and they get stuck and then yeah. they help us. Yeah. It happens. And now this guy was actually um, canonized as a saint and usually to perform, usually to become a saint, you have to go through a, a checklist of sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And one of those involves um, having miracles and a certain number of miracles. And uh, this guy didn't do any of that, but he was a saint. And the the reason that he's a saint is because somebody said um, that the angels came down and told him that Bede should be should be a saint. So he was a saint. <laughs> it sounds like somebody else went backwards in time and was like, hey, I'm looking for my boy Bede. And they're just like, we know Bede. He's not a It's a anymore. very Bill and Ted kind of it thing. Feels, this feels very much so like some time travel shenanigans. Like they went backwards in time, but they just didn't go far enough back in time. And they're like, we don't have Bede. And they're like, oh, this is the limit. If we go further back, we might get stuck like he did. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm just putting it out there, guys. Solving problems over here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Now, because Ostara is relatively um, new in the terms of um, holidays, and we don't have a whole lot of information about it, thanks to that sort of, like, void that happens in that, like, Dark Ages time frame between, like, the years 500 and 1200. Yeah. We don't really have a whole lot there. Most of the stuff that we have are things that are tied to rather more ancient traditions and rather more um, new traditions. This is very common to what we're seeing in, in particular with Yule. It has a lot in common with that. So um, throughout the world, um, festivals on the spring equinox or related to it are associated with new beginnings. A lot of new year happens around this time. Uh, eggs, rabbits, flowers, the theme of rebirth. Uh, the world is waking up in the Northern Hemisphere, so you really see a lot of that. In the Southern Hemisphere, we see a lot of the opposite of that. We see 
winter approaching. We see um, the the time for dead and dying things, mm -hmm. which we'll talk more about when we <laughs> get to the later half of the year. F F but it's not even summer yet, no. so <laughs> we're going to skip that for now. Uh, sorry for any of you in the Southern Hemisphere that happen to listen to this podcast. <laughs> yeah. We'll get there. Don't worry. Yeah. Now, there's a lot of similar things that happen across all of the um, cultures that celebrate this. And one of those is the coloring or decorating of eggs. Um, and the coloring or decorating of eggs and egg shells, um, because not everybody decorates just like a whole egg, um, has actually been traced as far back as 60,000 years ago. I mean, you got eggshells. What else are you going to do but make art with it? Now, I, I, yeah. find, I think that that is crazy. The oldest things that we've really talked about are going back maybe as far as 10,000 years. Yeah. But 60,000 years ago, that's almost two times the age of the, the Venus of Willendorf. That's the, that's the like thick goddess mm -hmm. statue. Um, and that's right around the time that humans started migrating out of Africa. And woolly mammoths still existed. We were like right in the middle of an ice age. There, that's older than cave paintings. Yeah. Um, younger than dinosaurs, older than cave paintings. So that is wild that they have found eggshells that have been decorated that far back. And they were ostrich eggshells. Mm -hmm. So they are thicker, they are larger, they're easier to find. So mm -hmm. yeah. um, we're gonna that, last the test of time, that kind of thing, yeah. Absolutely, and that absolutely blew my mind. I was doing the research for this and I remember like reading and going, whoa, and then just like, like leaning all the way back and going like, man, I gotta take a minute to deal with this and you were sitting at your computer which is adjacent to mine and kind of looked at me and I was just like do I tell him now yeah do I let I mean, him that's, go <laughs> that's like it, it's one of those things where where you know if people if people were were you know painting pieces of cloth we would never know right that's not going to last that mm -hmm. long it just happens that these ostrich eggshells lasted long enough for us to see that um but at the same time, I mean, people might have been a significantly different kind of people 60,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. But, uh, like, you know, I imagine there were still creative people and I imagine they still had to, like, paint something. Yeah, and there was still... Why not paint garbage? And there was still a connection to the divine, a want and a need to understand the world mm -hmm. and what's around you and make sense of it. Yeah, that's um, You know, and, and, like, it's not that far back because we haven't really found any human... Um, specimens that still have things but like you go 15 or 20,000 years back and you've got evidence that um, primitive man was doing tattoos for religious purposes yeah. and that they were using herbalism to try and cure their ailments so it's a it's a really common frame of mind to think about far far ancient man as being incredibly dumb and yeah. I mean, you, yeah, they're not as, they're not probably as smart as we are now, especially well, because we have technology, smart, smart our has brains have evolved, that, right? but they, they might not still... have the things that we have yeah. now, right? But just the same, a person from a thousand years in our future is, a, I mean, like, let's, let's be super real. If you went like a hundred years back in time and you showed somebody the internet they would have no clue what the fuck you're talking about mm -hmm. that's not because they're dumb it's just that they have no point from with which they can perceive what the hell you're even talking about right and what you're trying to show them and what you're trying to exemplify you know and and it, it's sort of the same idea as like like before you know keyboards and before typewriters right you wouldn't think of typeset in the way in which we yeah. think of it here. But at the same time, before the invention of the printing press, it was a big arduous task to duplicate a book or a scroll. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't something that you owned in your house. So you go to a time pre-printing press and you're like, hey guys, I got this book. And they're just going to be like, jeez, oh God, how rich is this guy with the book? Jeez, this guy with, look at this guy mm -hmm. f flaunting his book around. Mm -hmm. Ah, you got a book. Good for you, buddy. Go back to your castle, right? And it's just because we kind of, we got to sort of frame everything within, like, what was common at the time. And, uh, 
regardless of how old you are or how much you think you know, there will be a time in your life where something starts becoming common and you're just like, no, I don't really get what that is. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's... Is that yeah, TikTok for that's, you? I mean, I don't really get what that is, so... <laughs> like, I understand what TikTok is, but I don't really get why it's a thing at all. <laughs> Not at all. Just listen to a whole person sing a whole song. That's what YouTube's for. Or Facebook <laughs> video, if you're like... Feeling saucy, I guess. <laughs> Whoever uses Facebook video for shit. So, you know, it's just different. <laughs> you just made yourself sound like the oldest man. I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to have to learn what TikTok is, homie. That's not that's not what I'm doing here. <laughs> no. Yeah, that's not, so, that's not my jam. So yeah, decorated eggs. Um, now, uh, aside from the ancient part of decorating eggs, um, it's not surprising that eggs are associated with the spring mm -hmm. uh, festival here of Ostara, especially because this is when chickens would have started laying again. So yeah. modern breeds of chickens, and we have chickens, so we have um, some modern breeds, we have some heritage breeds, but... Um, Chickens didn't used to lay year round. That's a relatively new concept. Yeah. Um, chickens lay eggs based on the amount of light during the day, as well as the ambient average temperature and availability for food. So um, ancient chickens would have probably stopped laying around the shortly after the uh, the fall equinox and would have started laying again during the spring equinox or just before like around in bulk so um you know you really would have had eggs again and that would have been exciting and you yeah. probably would have had baby chickens and you know so you're you're you've got like baby birds happening you got yeah. all these like eggs yeah. well yeah your migratory birds are coming back you're laying animal you know like you're laying birds are starting to produce again all your farm animals this is like breeding season Mm -hmm. So that's when you get new animals. So you're not only getting an influx of food, but potentially an influx of trade goods or money um, because you now have this additional stuff, as well as this is sort of like a time of high, moti uh, high motion, you know, uh, um, and high motivation because now is the time where you can plant your crops and you can, you know, sow your seeds and prepare your land and, mm -hmm. and you know, move your, you know, start moving your your uh, farm animals out to eat again because there's not, you know, and, you know, like all that stuff starting to fight back, you know, or starting yeah. to turn back. And so life is kind of like fighting to life take, to take back away, the cold. So, as Ian Malkin would say. Yeah, it's, that's probably true, yeah. That's probably true. <laughs> I mean, we live in California and I joke that California has two seasons. We have a green season and a brown season. And this is part of our green season yeah. <laughs> right yeah. now. Um, so, you know, there's no direct connection with eggs and Ostara. But in the same time, there is a cultural association across all cultures mm -hmm. about that sort of thing with spring. And much like with the eggs, so too you can find with rabbits or hares. Um, because you have a lot of rabbits during the springtime in festivals and cultures and things like that. And that's really when they um, start bringing their babies out of the den. You know, they're, it's safer for them to find food outside. Perhaps they don't have any more stores left. The babies are a little bit older now. And rabbits breed like crazy. So rabbits, much like eggs, are really a no-brainer when you're thinking about a spring festival that's associated with innate fertility mm -hmm. of the animals of the mm -hmm. land of the people all of that stuff because if you were an ancient person what are you going to do during the winter time mm -hmm. you're gonna make babies and you will know that you are with child as a human generally if you had a baby around yule or later on you'd even be showing um by this time so this is really like connected to like deep baby heavy time yeah, this is really connected to like deep, deep roots that are sort of just engraved in really just like our DNA. <laughs> but it actually wasn't until 1682 that we have a mention of um, Easter hares or Easter rabbits. Mm -hmm. um, so even though it's sort of a no-brainer, it feels like it's very intrinsically tied in, It's it took a long time before we had any sort of information about rabbits being involved in these. And it happened in the Middle Ages. A German author 
named um, Georg Frank von Frankenau first mentions a German tradition um, of giving a st uh, of an Easter hare bringing eggs to children. Um, and there's also a a poem that's attributed to be around the Middle Ages time um, that talks about the goddess Eoster and 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 uh, a hair uh, and eggs and stuff. But it's actually been found that that was a literary forgery and that was written in the 1800s. So some people go, oh, no, Eoster is older than, um, you know, the, the traditions are older than that. They're actually, well, they probably are, but we don't have proof. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... After his author, uh, or after that guy mentioned a German tradition of the Easter hare bringing eggs for the children, it probably got to the point where the kids were like, well, how, wh how, did, this, how did this rabbit bring us eggs? Because kids are going to ask. And after Maybe. basically like 200 years, somebody finally decided to like put it down it's on the paper. That's what, that's what it was. <laughs> it's the chocolate it helps. Oh. Uh, but somebody finally decided to put it down on paper. So in the late 1800s. Put down the reason why yeah, rabbits yeah. bring In the late 1800s, it was very common for Germans and German immigrants that are in the United States to give a small stuffed animal that was shaped like a rabbit or uh, like a rabbit um, and some eggs uh, or egg-shaped cookies or cakes or candies um, to children for good luck on Easter morning. And at this point in time, there's a convergence of the ideas behind why this rabbit is bringing little children eggs. <laughs> and essentially, the idea is that the rabbit was originally a bird, and it got changed into a rabbit uh, by the goddess Eoster, but mm. only after laying some eggs. Mm. The reason why this... It's a robot this, in disguise, guys. Yeah, it's a transformer. Yeah. Um, or is that a beast? A beast war? Is that it's a beast It's not a beast war. It's a transformer. We don't talk about beast wars. Yeah. <laughs> it was an awful show. Yeah, so Eoster changed... So you can thank <laughs> Eoster and... Um, and the Germanic peoples for the Easter bunny because it was a bird that used to lay eggs and then it turned into a bunny rabbit and it never, just gave its eggs away. I have never heard that the publicly accepted excuse for Easter rabbits laying eggs is that it was originally a bird and the Oster turned it into a rabbit. That's, um, that, that's, that sounds crazy. That, to be completely <laughs> honest with you, uh, would cause me to ask significantly more questions as opposed to, I just assume the rabbit stole them from somewhere and brought them. Uh, it's a rabbit. But, uh, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, it used to be a bird. What kind of bird? Why? Those are the questions I have. What kind of bird and why? Was it originally a chicken? Well, why didn't they just say chicken? Why are they saying bird? Is it just like a, it was just some sort of a random bird? And then also, why would she turn a bird into a rabbit? The fuck is that all about? It seems mean. I don't know. You better, you're a rabbit now. I mean, it's possible that the bird has to be turned crisis. into a rabbit. But yeah. Why would a bird want to be a rabbit? That would, that would arguably be further down on the food chain. Yeah. Yeah. Because at least the bird's got like. Maybe it was like defenses. a lame bird, but now it's like a dope rabbit. <laughs> right. Like it went from like. A quail to like a jackalope. It's an upgrade. I mean, that is a glow up. Yeah, I'm just saying, like... Quail to jackalope? Quail to jackalope. And I like quails, like, don't get me wrong, but quails are, like, very dumb, unflying birds. Oh, um, they're so cute. Yeah, but they're also, like, lemmings, man. You just... They are. Where we live, so, during, like, the right time of year, you'll be driving on a back road, and you'll just stop, and you'll wait for just a bunch of quail to run across the street, and you're like... What are you, dumb? Get out of the road. I mean, at least the quail are trying to get out of the street as quickly as possible, yeah. unlike the turkeys. That's fair. Right, turkeys are huge and they don't care. Fearless, yeah. immortal creatures. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> I have been held up in traffic for like a half an hour <clears throat> because a small herd of turkeys so, decided to cross to the you, road. So, question to you. What do you think, you the re listener, if you're listening, um, have you ever heard of this bloody used to be a bird thing? Because I've never heard of this I've before. I've never heard of it. Not only have I never heard of this, I just don't accept this as an answer. This is <laughs> this answer is absurd. <laughs> it just poses more questions. Who th they're just like, oh, just tell them it used to be a bird, and they're like, what if they ask who turned it into a rabbit? You're like, say Eoster did it. 
And every like, the council of adults was like, eh, that's probably good enough information. I feel like even as a child, I would have been like, ah, uh, what? <laughs> I'm sorry, what did you just say to me? That's significantly more complicated. I was happy with just a thieving rabbit, but now <laughs> I gotta contend with potentially being turned into a rabbit if I piss. We're back. Woo. Woo. Okay, Woo. let's keep going. All right. So um, there really isn't a whole lot else to talk about with the history of Ostara. Uh, that's a that's about it uh, until we get into like more modern customs or really splintering off into Easter or other cultures' customs. So I wanted to keep it just nice and broad, nice and this is a one hundred and one course about Easter. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about what we do mm -hmm. for Ostara normally. So what's our what's our normal our normal game? For Ostara. Well, I mean, we're looking at a at a time where you can't Regardless have people over. Regardless of right now, over, us not but, being able to have people over. Um, yes, we would generally have people over for a ritual. Mm -hmm. And for Ostara, we do a ritual that's like, we have, um, we usually do a fire and you read your part of the ritual. Mm -hmm. I read my part of the ritual. Yours is a bit more Norse mm -hmm. inspired. Mm -hmm. And mine is a bit more um, generalized pagan. You know, I don't necessarily invoke any particular deities or anything like that. Yeah. And um, Easter is about a time of welcoming new things. So it's about, um, you know, we usually do a meditation as part of it. We always invite people to bring something to burn mm -hmm. um, because we have an outside fire pit. Yeah. So... Um, we find that I've found that every, every Sabbath has either a theme of, um, welcoming or releasing. So this one is really a welcoming one. So this one, um, we usually give people little dried bay leaves and Sharpie markers so they can write their wishes on there for the next year. So, um... You know, we usually do that, and we have a big spring-themed feast for everyone. Yeah. We've got fresh flowers. Yeah. We, we always include food. We always generally include some sort of a craft in mm -hmm. our rituals, some sort of a, like, you know, like, come and celebrate the ritual and then, like, go home with, a with like, a party gift. But it's not like a party gift, you it's know like what I'm saying? It's like a gift that you made for yourself. It's, like a, it's yeah. like a fun, witchy thing that you can make for yourself. Kind yeah, of a we thing, usually do so. flower crowns, so we usually have like a bunch of fake flowers around, mm -hmm, some mm -hmm. real flowers. We have uh, a lot of ivy where we live, so we'll have ivy like in Rope. length so, or like, in ropes. ropes. Yeah, or we'll have it either already in a circle so that you can do that sort yeah, of thing like for like a circle with like hot glue and ribbons and stuff. So and all the stuff. Yeah, we mm -hmm. we um, you know, we generally have a good time with Ostara. Um, you know, just cause it's sort of like the beginning of spring, mm -hmm. sort of a, sort of a ritual. Um, and, uh, it's uh, like the beginning yeah. of my birthday season too. So Ostara is always the one where the parties kind of like kick off. Yeah. It's, um, so it's, you know, the weather's getting better and you're able to get back with friends and such like that. I mean, not now, obviously not yet at least, but, uh, yeah, no. So we always do a good Ostara ritual. Again, I'll say this every time we bring it up. Uh, if you are doing some fire based stuff, have a fire extinguisher on hand, know mm -hmm. how to use your fucking fire extinguisher, which is like crazy to have to say out loud, but like, you should know how to use the fire mm -hmm. extinguisher inside of your house. Um, you know, be fire safe. We have like a huge fire pit outside. I have like two fire extinguishers out there. Um, we always have like people watching it. You know, we like, we know what we're doing. If we're deciding not to do a fire in a fire pit, we have a, a wood burning stove here in the house, uh, for, you know, like to heat the living room. Uh, so we use that like carefully. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're using like a cauldron for like a burn bowl or something like have a fire extinguisher, don't have the cauldron on something that will melt or near something that will melt. Make sure you have some water to douse the fire. If it's an oil fire, don't start it. Make That's sure the, the end cauldron of that. You don't know what you're doing. Make sure it's a fire. temperature safe cauldron. Yeah. So like, just be smart and safe, mm -hmm. right? Like your kitchen has a whole area specifically engineered to be safe about that stuff. Mm -hmm. So like, keep that the fuck in mind. Yeah. Uh, be fire safe. Um, but definitely, I mean, you know, we you know we write our own ritual 
for when we do these things and uh you know it's it's a lot of research like what we're doing here mm -hmm. so like do your research you know find what you like uh if you did a ritual one way last year and you feel like you should change it then go ahead and change it Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's it, it it has to change with the times. It has to adapt to what you feel makes the most amount of sense. Just the same as as you're changing. But if you feel like what you wrote last time was perfect and you don't want to change it, then you don't have to either. So, yeah. well, and you know, find what works best for you. If you've never really if you don't really know what to do and you're looking at other rituals from a variety of authors, there is no right way or wrong way to do mm -hmm. it. Um, you know, you can use their ritual. You can make changes to it yourself. Mm -hmm. If you, um, you know, want to do a big, long thing, you can. But if you don't want to, you don't have to. Yeah. Yeah, you can um, definitely do something shorter. You in can length. definitely make it shorter. If nothing else, what we've been doing for the past year, since we can't really have people over, um, is we just have, like, a nice dinner um and for and nice is subjective right so sometimes I mean, for us a nice dinner just... is us wanting hot wings or mcdonald's and yeah. sometimes it's me making like a really complex meal with uh or we're eating a whole one bunch of the chickens of or something yeah like that. yeah we you know make if nothing else we always like light a candle have a nice dinner have an offering and um typically just kind of like like hang out at our altar yeah uh, we usually always clean off our altars beforehand while we're getting ready for the season yep. and yep. rearrange them so put on a good movie make it make a make a fun night of it yeah make a you fun know, night if, of if it if you're at home by yourself and all you can do for Astara is be at home by yourself then like make a good night of it get something if the food that you really want to eat or the or or you want to treat yourself with is taco bell that's fine yeah, like we're we, not gonna hate people. Uh, Just all right. get you one of those Doritos logos. Every, every tacos. everybody makes a big fuss about you got it, it's got to be this exact thing. All right, mm -hmm. what's more important than it being this exact thing? Whatever the fuck this exact thing is about literally anything, regardless of what the fuck it is. Like if this is the thing that you want to do, and it's like not you're not like harming other people or being a piece of shit or something like that, um, then then do that thing. Like you don't need to worry yeah. that like oh well on Ostara you're supposed to eat uh rabbits that were at one point in time birds well you know what you're not going to get one of those so just have some chicken mcnuggies or whatever the heck you know what i'm saying like like if that's what yeah. you want man that's what you want and that's what you're going to do uh it's more about your experience on that kind of thing in my personal opinion yeah it you know really have a good have it a good really night is. about it you know if you have friends who are in the space who are like chill you know, you could always, like, do, like, a Google Hangout or mm -hmm. a, a Zoom or a Teams mm -hmm. or just, uh, or just like, text back and forth all night or decide as a group of friends that we're all going to watch the same movie together and then do that. Uh, we have, from now until Easter, like, we just want to mostly focus on zombie movies. Yeah. So we're watching a bunch of zombie movies right now. That's, like, that's like has been our thing. Uh, uh, the last day or so since we like watched one zombie movie and was like, this is perfect. Yeah. Um, so we've been in the like zombie movie <laughs> we've mode. We've definitely been in that like headspace. Yeah. So we're, so that's like you, we're doing yeah. like zombie movies and and like I, like we don't even know what we're gonna do for dinner for Ostara yet. You know. So like, yeah, we're and probably that's just coming up do in a few days. Whatever, so yeah. yeah. Uh, but like also, if you're closeted, it uh, you know you. If you're closeted, there's a lot of small ways that you can celebrate, you know, yeah. so you can still have a nice dinner. It doesn't have to do with anything. Yeah. You can go out and enjoy the sunshine or get yourself some flowers or pick some flowers. Uh, you know, you can do any of those things without necessarily outing yourself. You don't have to make it a big a big deal. capital deal with yeah. a big all caps ritual <coughs> or anything like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, you know, we've all got, we're all under a lot of stress. We've all got a lot of things going on. And if you feel like the most you can possibly muster yourself to do three days after Ostara is to light a candle and like eat some takeout in the dark while you watch a movie, do that. Enjoy it. The purpose of a festival is to is to em is to embrace the changing of the seasons mm -hmm. because each uh, each thing in the wheel of the year represents a slightly different part of 
the season. And Aostara really is the season of spring in full swing. So we, so that's really what you're celebrating. And um, there's a lot of pressure on people to make things, uh, you know, Instagram pretty or make real dumb, Pinterest level. Don't let social media get bobs. to you guys. But Other people's opinions like, don't really, matter. it's like you do Gotta you. Gotta stress that. Yeah, do you. That's yeah. what's important. <laughs> if you if you can make a thing and that's your thing, like dope. Um, if somebody's giving you the business for it, then they're they're probably not there to help you and support you, and that's not nice, right? I mean, yeah. like criticism is as criticism does, and it, you know, rightfully so, it, it needs to exist. Yeah. You know, if, if something's if something's silly, we gotta point it out or what have you. But at the same time, you know, like you don't need to take hate from people or what or whatever the heck. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so let's yeah. uh, let's go on so, to some suggested um, ideas. Yeah, so we've got some... I don't have an Ostara ritual for you, just because that's generally a little bit longer than we would want to cover here in this podcast. But yeah. if you are so interested, we can do a bonus video. Yeah. Um, or if people are, um, you know join us on Patreon, we'd be happy to get a ritual out to you if you have a Norse or general pagan-type bend to your practice. Yeah, or question. If you or just questions. have some questions or you want to talk about it, or hey, do you have like a dope Ostara? A theory do you know what kind of bird the chicken the rabbit You're was before? still on this bird thing it's 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 <laughs> so stupendously <laughs> idiotic an answer and it's not that like it's like in a like hating on it way it's just not an answer it's a non-answer and that's so upsetting to me and so yeah i'm gonna make fun of it forever what was the bird it's always interesting to me which weird fact from the yeah. past I don't that care. I it's find shit that you like latch years old. Who fucking cares? For me, it's Fine, the it's the eggshells. Nah, who fucking like, cares? Paint bird eggshells. Turned it into a what rabbit. else are you going to do but paint eggshells or carve symbols into rocks? You got nothing but rocks and sticks around you, right? <laughs> what are you going to do? That's fine. But this like late edition information <laughs> to manipulate children because kids were questioning free shit too much, I think not good, sir. I call shenanigans. I think that there's some sort of bird-based rabbit conspiracy going on here. <laughs> at the Oestra, at the bloody core of it all, hiding some fact about some shit we don't know about. Somewhere the rabbits from Watership Down are, like, cowering. <laughs> no, no, ma'am. <laughs> so, because it's egg time, and our chickens are starting to lay more eggs again, which is very exciting for me, um, it, we're going to talk about some egg spells. Let's do some egg stuff. Yeah, and you can incorporate these into an Ostara ritual, or really, you can do these at any point in time you want. So, um, first we're going to talk about painted eggs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it is an old custom to have painted eggs in your home. And uh, the idea behind it is that you have four eggs and those eggs get placed in the four corners of your home mm -hmm. uh, and they help to protect your house. Uh, and you would want to replace them if one breaks. That generally means that somebody is trying to get you. But at the same time, like gravity is a thing and eggshells are brittle. So sometimes they just break. That's true. Uh, yeah. You know, a couple of painted eggs in here. We have a wooden painted egg somewhere too that's just lost. Yeah, it's behind it you. Just you can't moves. see it. Yeah. So oh. um, I yeah. So I usually do uh, blown eggs this time of year, and I normally go absolutely crazy with it because we usually have a bunch of people over, and you know we haven't been able to really do that. So um, what you do to blow eggs <laughs> is you take your egg. And then you take a, like a large needle or sharp implement with like a pointy like tip. Like the tip of a knife. Yeah, like the tip when of a knife. When you're tapping a hole in the tip of an, uh, with the tip of a knife And you just like egg, tap on the top. You do not tap like this, right? You don't tap no. it with, with your, with the with your hand, hand like that. Like right. you, you motion. Just, you just pinch the end of the knife. So a little bit of the point is coming out in between your index and, and thumb, like your point, you know, point your finger and your thumb, right? And you just tap like that. You can have a bunch of knife back of your hand. That's fine. But you just tap with a little bit. Let me tell you what, dude. I have seen so many people cut themselves doing dumb shit with knives. Boy, am I just glad like, you've never seen me do that. Be smarter <laughs> with knives. It requires zero effort, yeah. and then you don't get hurt. It's the same... Listen, anything that we talk about that involves knives, you're going to hear me lecture you about knives. It's the same thing with fire. You be safe so you don't <laughs> hurt yourself because you're a frail human, and it's super easy to hurt yourself. We're covered by this stuff. Not very protective. I'm going to be super honest with you. The skin stuff. So... 
yeah. don't hurt it. It does hold your bits in where they need to be for the most part. Sometimes so, barely. So to blow eggs, you take a sharp implement. Now I know you want to tap and, and like it's kind of natural to want to tap and blow out the top of the egg. But when you look at an egg, there's, one, there's a bottom and there's a top. So the top is slightly less wide than the bottom of the egg. Not every single egg is this way, but chicken eggs in particular are and most eggs are. Mm -hmm. So you want to take the bottom of the egg and you want to tap on that one first. And you want to tap a hole that is a half of a centimeter wide tops yeah we're talking very very small like the lead holes. part of a wooden pencil yeah and you want to make sure pencil. that when you're tapping into it with your sharp object that you do pierce the albumin that's the little white piece on the, yeah. the white film the on the inside of the egg i have found that using a big like sewing needle like really a carpet helps needle for this. or like a, a leather needle. needle yeah is yeah. the best now once you've poked a hole in the bottom you flip it over and now poke a hole in the top uh and this is so that it's already bottom a side nail, down the nail, nail will work. work yeah a clean nail. um clean it first please yeah. um <laughs> a thumbtack or a push pin would also work yeah and then you tap the hole on the top now you actually want the hole on the top to be smaller than the hole on the bottom by about half so you want this to be again very small yeah. like you want the hole on the top to be no bigger than the end of a tine a on a fork smash that's not what you're supposed to do that's how you get smashed eggs hey stop hammer time no. <laughs> no. Hammer time. Boo. Yep. I'm the one who does the puns around here. Yeah, well, but, I mean, Captain Hammer, what are you going to do? Apparently nothing. So um, it's best to do this when you want to make, like, scrambled eggs or when you're doing baking so that you're not just, like, wasting eggs unnecessarily. Yeah. Um, and it's primarily you want to do it with things where you're going to be blending the egg yolk and the uh, white together. Yeah, you can't so, blow an egg out and make, like, an omelet that's not... That's not how that. Well, or no, I'm not an not omelet. not make an egg over easy. You yeah, gotta yeah. Make you, an can't, omelet. you can't. You gotta do... make an omelet or like scrambled eggs. Yeah, you like, can't do uh, sunny side up, but yeah. you can do pretty much anything else. Yeah. Uh, so you want to blow the egg from the top, from the top, out the bottom, out through the bottom, into a dish, into a and dish then or a bowl. Check that dish for tiny egg bits. Yeah. Because if you t if you're tapping carefully and it's way easier with a needle because if you tap with a needle, and then you can kind of use the end of the needle to sort of like flick the eggshells. Wait, do this over a sink, by the way. Um, but um, then when you blow it out, you still want to double check to make sure there aren't no tiny egg bits. Nobody's trying to bite into a banana bread with tiny egg bits cutting up the roof of their mouth. That would be crazy town. Wow, I feel like uh, I'm under attack because I just made banana bread. No, banana bread was just the most recent baked good okay. that I ate. <laughs> I was like, yeah. you did not tell me. No, I no, 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 no. There's, not, there's no eggshells in our banana bread. Yeah, <laughs> it was just the most recent baked good that I ate. I could have sent in a hot dog yeah. bun, now, but who's making hot dog buns at home? I mean, we are sometimes, we but are like, sometimes. really, who's making hot dog buns at home? That's crazy. Um... <laughs> Now, if you try to start blowing it out, it will take some force, but don't like blow your eardrums out or something. Yeah. If nothing is clearly coming out, it means that you haven't popped the the albumin, the sack on the inside yet. Yeah. And just like take a implement and just poke at it. Yeah. Um, be careful. So, yeah, be careful. Yeah. Now, um, breathe in first, then apply the egg to your face, then blow out. And this is the reason why <laughs> you don't need to breathe the egg into your lungs. Right, we've all seen like Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, and every other time somebody's trying to use a blowgun and sucks a dart into their face, which doesn't make any fucking sense, but yeah. that's fine. So, yeah, now, just throwing those out there. Once you've blown out the contents of the egg, um, you're going to have still like expel the contents once you expel the contents of your blown egg you're going to still have like some 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 goopy bits in there so you don't want to you want to do this a little bit beforehand of this particular project uh, yeah i would say like a day or so beforehand yeah you, well you want these to die, you want these to dry for longer than day okay. so you usually want the blown eggs to dry for a couple of days to a week yeah um now if you're short on time you can put them in the well, in a dehydrator if you've got one, or in the oven on the absolute lowest setting you can, uh, and you would put them in there for 30 minutes at a time until the egg is no longer dripping goop. 
<laughs> so, um, so that's how you make a blown egg. What, what do you? So you're blowing the egg out. What are you doing? You're just taking the thing, smashing an empty eggshell. Now, what are you doing with that? What are you putting that? No. Are you setting? Are you setting that back in the egg carton to dry? Because I feel like that's how you get rotten bottom egg cartons. Uh, I usually put them on the windowsill because both sides are open. Mm. Okay. Yeah, you want you don't want it like, like close it into your into your back to your egg carton because it um, will stick to the egg carton as yeah. it dries. I would say like if you if you know enough for nothing if you don't have a windowsill you can you can rest it on or something like that. Uh, you could always uh, place it on a shot glass because a yeah. shot glass would allow it to still breathe and drip and such. Yeah, um, you could absolutely do yeah, that. So yeah, so once you have your eggs expelled. And, and dried. And dried. Um, now you're going to collect some art supplies. So you're going to collect um, whatever medium of your choice is. So if you like markers or pencils or crayons or paint or um, even wax is popular for decorating eggs in Eastern Europe, go ahead and gather that stuff around. I do not recommend using oil paints. Uh, but you can also use glitter. You could use egg dyeing kits. Yeah. Uh, any of that sort Resin. of thing. Resin, I guess. Um, yeah. Seems like a lot of work. Uh, and then you also want to get some ribbon or some yarn. I did that pour painting on that egg. So. <laughs> now, um, what you want to do from here is you're going to use your art medium of choice to decorate these eggs with protective and also pretty symbols. You um, SpongeBob stickers, glitter, yeah, you can all use the stickers, stuff. All, whatever you want can go on yeah. this egg. And you would just use like protective symbols. And as you're creating it, you just want to think that like the egg is a shell. The shell protects your home. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Not that you need to chant that or anything like that. That's what you want to have as an intention. You want to glitter. You just you put down the glue and then you let that tack up a little bit. Spread yeah. the glitter on. Shake that off. Yeah, I mean, yeah, let's you make got, it like... You got like, everything you can do. I've seen them do it yeah, with... Yeah, let's make um, it like kids' art time. With plastic. You take a plastic spoon. This is adult time. You take a plastic spoon and a Dremel, and you carve the symbol that you want through the plastic spoon with the Dremel. Um, so that way, when you hold it up to your egg and you dust it with like a, with like a spray paint or like mm. a blow paint or uh, like an airbrush, uh, you can transplant the symbol on that. Mm -hmm. um, we've definitely used. Uh, I've definitely used stamps before. Mm -hmm. Like if you have stamps of the symbol that you that you want to apply, you know, um, I you know, a sharpie. I use <laughs> uh, I use alcohol ink pens so, because they lay down a lot of pigment, and so like you can use that kind of a thing. So like the sky's the limit on this. Um, with regard to how you want to do your like symbols yeah. and such like my that. favorite method is to get crayons and do color resist so you take the crayons and then you draw on your egg and then the egg goes into a batch of easter egg dye now when you have the blown eggs it is important that in order to dye them properly with the easter egg dye that you make sure that the dye gets all up inside the inside of the hollow of the egg so yeah. you want to tilt it so that it bubbles and hold it underneath and sinks until underneath. the last bubble goes bloop that's right. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, you'll have like a halfway dyed egg. And if that's your intention, that's great. But um, I like doing that with color resist. So I'll take sometimes uh, like a white or a silver or even neon crayons, mm -hmm. draw on the eggs and then dye them. That's my personal favorite. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to do. And then once you're done and your eggs are dry, whatever it is that you used, um, just keep in mind when you are arting on these eggs that they are less, less able to withstand force than they would be with yeah. their contents inside. You will crush. Like if you plan on doing three <laughs> eggs, what I recommend is you get like nine. You are going to, you're going to get the first egg. You're just going to jam a pencil into your hand and crush the egg. Mm -hmm. And then the second egg, you're going to start doing that and you're going to start painting it. You're going to get like three quarters of the way through and then you're going to crush that fucking egg. Mm -hmm. And then one of them, you're certainly going to set on the counter and then be like, oh, that's pretty and turn around and the egg's going to be like, <laughs> nope. And then just fall <laughs> off the counter and be crushed. Like it's, it's, it is a fragile shell. Mm -hmm. So be cautious of that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's definitely, I, I cannot tell you how many times I have f just utterly destroyed an <laughs> egg, right? Or you like drip, dip an egg in the solution and you wait until all the droplets drop out and then you grab the egg off and the egg wasn't perfectly straight and there was a little pocket and you of still liquid have down there that gets and, it, over the table. And, it, and it falls out and just burns your hand and you're just like, <laughs> ah, crush that egg. So yeah, we've, we've also done like a ton of like egg 
like like egg art stuff and so sometimes you just sometimes they break yeah right or when you're trying to thread them or any of the other that's stuff. actually the next piece i know look at that is Perfect to transition. thread them so once your eggs have dried you're going to want to go ahead and take whatever your decorative ribbon or yarn is and you're going to want to make a big loop now you want this loop to be a little bit more than two times or than four times the length of an egg mm -hmm. so you want to loop it over so it makes it like a big long U and you want to be able to pull that through the top part of the egg. Now, before you do that all the way, you need to tie a knot in the bottom and you want that knot to be large enough to hold the egg in place. Mm -hmm. If you, um, if you aren't sure if you can tie that knot or if you want to add a little bit of decorative flair, you can actually thread your yarn or your ribbon through a button and have a button at the bottom of the egg and then pull it through the top of the egg and then the egg rests on top of the button and you can do a button on top you can do really whatever you kind of yeah. want here sort of the sky is the limit and then once you've done that you just place them in the four corners of your home or your room they can be displayed or they can be hidden yeah. depending on your preferences and you want to replace them each year yeah you just um, hang them yeah or if one breaks go ahead and replace that and there's a lot of um ideas behind why one would break and the most common idea behind that is that someone um is is trying to curse or hex yeah. you the generalized interpretation is often that someone is trying to like get at you and the egg broke doing its job uh, think of it as like ablative armor yeah um so the egg ablated away um that not great energy or what have you mm -hmm. so give that guy a replacement and uh and yeah go, and just on. go on with it yeah. we generally have blown out eggs just like in like various all places all around the house, because when we get a particularly cool egg from the chickens, I'll be like, "Yeah, I'm gonna blow sometimes we don't even decorate them. It's just like a pretty egg, you know. I mean, that's a yeah. benefit of having your own chickens and, you know, getting free eggs from them and such. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's painted protection yeah. eggs. Paint, paint you some eggs. Decorate some eggs. Uh, TLDR, uh, painting eggs is super fun. Mm -hmm. And as an adult, trust me, you're missing out if you're not doing it. Uh, all that fun egg painting that you had as a kid, yeah, there's way more art stuff you can do now because you're an adult, so you can buy whatever you want. Um, yeah. And decorate it however you want. We've, like, gilded eggs. Oh, yeah. Like, you can do, you can do, the sky is so much more the limit than it, like, yeah. was when and you were you a kid. And if you feel like you're not particularly artistically inclined, um, you know, pop over to Etsy or your local shop or, you know, your local stationery shop and pick up some stickers. Yeah. From an independent artist, support yeah. them. Look in up a an egg time. decorating lathe. It's like the coolest little toy. It's a little oh yeah, we had one of those when I was a kid. Holds the egg and spins it, so you can mm -hmm. be like, ah, oh, wobbly lines on it and shit. Those are tight. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's so many cool ways that you can do this sort of stuff nowadays. Um, like, it really is the sky's the limit with regard to just bedazzle your egg, dude. Make your eggs fabulous. Yeah, one year when I was a kid, we decided to do, um, we decided to decorate eggs with wax. Which is uh, called Piansky, I think. Um, and it was a really fun project. We dyed the eggs first, and my mom got different colored candles, and we melted them down, and she used to make teeth. So we used a bunch of, like, dental implements to, to, to pick up the wax and then drip it and move it around on the eggs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was yeah. very fun. That's I think dope. she still has some of those eggs. That's dope. Uh, That's dope. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're back. Hey, guys. One last thing. Two last things, actually. Uh, well, they're not really last things. We still got more stuff to talk about. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm talking about. These are the things. Let's talk about them. No. <laughs> uh, so, the next egg-based thing we've got for you is divination. So, um, it was a common practice in the 19th century in England and Ireland and Scotland, as well as, I think, in France and Germany, but definitely in the UK, for you to do egg divination and you would usually do eggs into a glass of water and then you would see how they react and you would do that but that just seems like a whole waste of an egg to me and if i can get a chance to do some kitchen witchery you better believe i'm gonna do some kitchen witchery so um i've got a recipe for you and it is egg drop divination soup so what you're gonna do is you're gonna take um uh, a one and a half cups of broth. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, broth is not only your tasty medium here, but broth is also for good health. Yeah. Both vegetable broth or meat based broth. Yep. Whatever broth. Whichever you broth want. you prefer. Yeah. You're going to take one raw egg. Now, if you're going to split this um, with somebody else, you can, you know, um, you know, change your amount. Yeah, all of recipes things, are subject to change. Yeah. So you're going to take your raw egg. You're going to take one teaspoon of cornstarch. And uh, cornstarch is used as a thickener in cooking, but it is also magically charged to aid in divination. Uh, you're going to take two teaspoons of cold water. Uh, some salt, some sugar, some pepper to taste. That's all pretty standard stuff. I know I said sugar. Um, sugar does help to enhance the taste of even umami, um, you know, sort of savory things. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if you've got it, a pinch of turmeric that is both for color as well as for protection. Uh, optional is sesame oil. That one's just for taste. <laughs> And uh, the last optional item is green onion or scallions, depending on how you like to call those what they are. Uh, and you want those to be chopped for a garnish. And that is also for prosperity as well as taste. So you get all your ingredients together. And as you're gathering them, you want to, um, you know, think about the magical purposes of these items. You want to think about what it is that you want to gain from this divination. Are you looking at something specific? Are you looking for more of a generalized divinatory type of a reading? Um, and you want to just kind of keep your mind clear. Let yourself be in a zen place. So now that you've got all your ingredients together, you're going to go ahead and stir together the cornstarch and the cold water. In general, you want to stir things clockwise uh, uh, for good luck. And um, once you have stirred together the cornstarch and the water, set it aside. Then you're going to combine the broth, the salt, the pepper, the turmeric, the sesame oil in a small pot. Bring that to a boil. And uh, once that's at a boil, you'll slowly add the cornstarch and water mixture, stirring uh, to incorporate that liquid into the other liquid. <laughs> uh, and you'll let that come to a boil again. Now is the fun part with the egg. And this one does take a little bit of trial and error, but the best way for you to do it is to take your raw egg and beat it slightly. Put it into a small uh, teacup or um, measuring cup or something like that. Use a tiny whisk, use a fork. Um, and then once you are ready with that, you're gonna go ahead and pour the egg mixture slowly into the boiling soup liquid. And as you are pouring, you want to have a stir thing happen and just sort of constantly. And you mentally want to ask the universe or your patron deities or your ancestors or whoever it is that you work with to uh, show you what the future holds through the patterns that the egg makes. So continue stirring uh, and thinking about this until the egg is completely in the soup. And then once the egg is in the soup, you can go ahead and serve it right away. It doesn't need much additional cooking time because it's getting all of its cooking heat from the heat of the broth itself. Mm -hmm. So pour your egg soup into a bowl or a cup, preferably a bowl, and top it with the green onions if you're using those. Now, um, now you're done with the making part of it and you get to do the fun part, which is the divination. So um, you're going to gaze at the soup, noting any symbols or figures or things that are feelings that stand out to you. Uh, and once you've done that, it's a good idea to write all this stuff down. That's what your book of shadows is for. Um, and, uh, you know, if you have a symbol, you're not really sure what it means, you know, consult a, consult a tea leaf dictionary. Um, you could also use a dream dictionary, but I've found for, uh, physical things that tea leaves are often, um, a very, a very easy to find kind of dictionary and have a lot of meaning towards them with any sort of food bits, you know, so maybe you get, uh, you know, a Maybe you're looking at it and you see the figure of a bird and you're like, oh man, I wonder if that bird's going to turn into a rabbit. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm not happy. <laughs> and you could look up the meaning for bird yeah. in a tea leaf dictionary, or you can just sort of infer based on your own tradition and your own knowledge what you think that means, what you feel it means. Uh, and then yeah. you've just done so, some kitchen witch divination. The thing with divining in this nature, it's going to be sort of similar to fire. It's going to be sort of similar to to water with colors or water with leaves or water with petals or anything to that extent. You know, like, um, you know, reading the surf or anything like that. There's kind of like an infinite number of ways to approach that particular situation. I know one of the ways that... Um, that I like to use and is and is fairly common is sort of stream of consciousness writing. So it's sort of like um, while you're staring into the soup, even while I mean you know while you're while you're stirring into the soup and 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 stirring it as symbols jump out, you can use numbers, you can use Roman letters, you can use uh, like runes, you could use uh, whatever like cuneiform or or kanji <laughs> or w whatever language you want to interpret it through, right? And then just like as you see a symbol appear, write it down, and then write down the next symbol, write down the next symbol, write down the next symbol, and um, you know once you've once you've gone through an amount of symbols that you feel is appropriate, you can then later go back and translate those as you see fit. So there's a bunch of different ways to do this. Kind of find the one that works best for you with regard to it. But uh, you know the, the the value here is is that you can add or subtract anything you want. You can make this vegan safe or vegetarian safe or or whatever uh, fancy newfangle uh, diet uh, yeah. people are on nowadays. Safe, what, whatever your you know, uh, can and can't eats are and adjust it accordingly. I mean, the idea is that you can use an egg and to be completely honest with you, you could probably do this with, um, synthetic egg substitute. Yeah. You could do this if, with if you synthetic so wanted, egg substitute. Uh, it, you um, know, it, it's, it's the idea is, is that you're, you're producing an, um, an unevenly like colored looking mixture mm -hmm. uh and you're trying to see what you can see within it yeah. so don't think that that you know and this recipe will be found in the show notes if you're watching this on youtube in the thing below um uh as well as uh if you hit us up on patreon we'll you know i think we're gonna start doing more recipes up on mm -hmm. patreon um for uh for a bunch of the things that we do with regard to like kitchen witchery and stuff but i mean kitchen yeah. witchery is very like if if you want to add a thing or subtract a thing or make it more or less complex you know just uh consult your local uh uh herbalist and and figure out what you want to put in it right <laughs> like every question everything has a meaning and every meaning has a thing so you know kind of kind of move forwards yeah that yeah. way it doesn't necessarily need to be like an herb you know it can be if you want onions in your egg drop soup or if you want noodles you know yeah. there, there's well, symbolism behind everything yeah. so yeah well and if you are um you know if you are a person who does not want to or cannot eat eggs you can substitute the eggs for uh noodles in particular quick cooking noodles like uh, top ramen noodles or rice noodles any kind of asian noodle that's fast cooking is a good idea here you could do traditional spaghetti noodles but it would take a long time to do it's a way i guess you could <laughs> but do it, you could certainly do that yeah. um, again you can use egg substitute or you, you can... could you just use i mean if you're using a vegetable broth and cut up vegetables in it that's it's the same thing. Yeah, if you wanted to use vegetables you know, instead, I highly recommend look getting, for the space between the things. getting some uh, cabbage, like a head of cabbage, and cutting it thin and then cooking that into the broth until that sort of is not as, um, as crispy, you know, so mm -hmm. it's sort of a little more wilted in there. So there are a yeah. lot of ways that you can modify this. And yeah. if you, you know, want to use... Uh, you know, garlic, because you like the taste of garlic. Uh, garlic also has its own innate correspondences. Garlic yeah. helps to protect you against evil magics and is a protective agent well, as every, well. Everything in your kitchen has some sort of correspondence meaning is That's really right. the way that you need to look at that. That's so, right. Yeah. Speaking of, let's move on to correspondences. Yeah. So correspondences, it's 
that time. Uh, so correspondences for Ostara, we're looking at animals. So we've talked about rabbits. We've talked about birds, any kind of bird, uh, chickens and baby chicks, uh, any really baby animal, I think kind of fits the bill here. Um, but hedgehogs, phoenix, uh, merfolk, fairies, all are... Yeah, merfolk and fairies are not animals, but that's fine. That's true, but they fit in that category, and that's where I left them. Okay, well, that's... I'll put them somewhere That's crazy. Else. They'll be in a better category. Yeah, mer <laughs> merfolk are not animals. That's racist. I'm sorry. Uh, colors. We've got silver. We've got green. And uh, any kind of pastel. Yeah. Any pastel color you want. Um, stones and crystals. We're looking at amethyst, aquamarine, citron, bloodstone and red jasper for uh herbs we're looking at a lot of floral stuff so pretty much anything you can see blooming right now uh so strawberries and violets and lilies daffodils tulips are hot hyacinth narcissus uh moss any sort of flowering trees are also associated with ostara as far as foods, we're looking at seasonal foods. So we're looking at dairy and eggs, of course. Uh, seeds, breads, especially sweet breads this time of year. Sprouts and asparagus, ham, lamb, uh, and really any other seasonal fruits and vegetables. It kind of depends on where you are and you know, what your climate is like there, but that's kind of, you know, whatever you can see that's that's on sale because it's in season at the supermarket, that's really where you wanna hone in there. Traditional drinks are milk, herbal teas, lemonade, beer, wine. It's always beer and always wine. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, water. Water isn't always one also. For incense, you're really going to want to look at anything that's sort of flowery or refreshing. So yeah. any of those like quote unquote water scents yeah. you could use. Well, and to... anything, your, your rose and your lavender and any sort of flower incense, you know, if it's, yeah. if it's saying the name of a flower, that's, that's the right, that's the right one. That's right. That's right. Uh, as far as um, deities, there's a lot of deities that are associated with the springtime. Mm -hmm. So in particular, we're looking at um, those that are associated with dawn and rebirth and fertility. So we're looking at Eos and Aurora, Freya, uh, Ishtar and Astarte. Yeah. Hathor, Demeter, Persephone, Aphrodite can go here too. Um, the maiden part of the triple goddess. Uh, and we're also looking at the time of the green man. If you look at the green man v. Holly King side of things. Yeah. Um, the uh, Hindu goddesses Ushas is also associated with this time of year as well as Angus Og. Nice. who is a uh, Celtic uh, deity. Uh, and then other symbols are eggs, the new moon, and butterflies. I should put mulf, merfolk and fairies right there. And merfolk and fairies. There you go. Red acted. Uh <laughs> it's fine. She's new to this, guys. It's only like the eighth episode or something. Uh, yeah, but that is, uh, that is Ostara. And this, that, this brings us to the end or what have you yeah so yeah uh this was just ostara 101 this is a little baby ostara video and uh this was sort of like a like a top-down look uh you know in future we plan on delving a little bit more deeper into uh very specific things uh if you have any questions about this stuff reach out us reach out to us on social media or uh, hit us up on youtube mm -hmm. just uh check out the video on youtube and comment below if you are on youtube comment below uh like this video share this video subscribe to this channel uh these come out every other monday um if you're listening to us on podcast we're a uh, nerd jive on youtube so check mm -hmm. out our youtube channel we've got uh, we've got a ton of stuff there. We do, uh, Mondays are the podcast, so you can look at our faces while we talk, um, or, uh, our Merkvedheim vlogs, which is just like a nice little home vlog place where you learn about our house and home. Mm -hmm. Um, Tuesdays are reviews, 
So we do movie reviews with Review Jive Thursdays, our Star Trek Thursdays. We watch, uh, we're watching Voyager right now, so check us out there. And uh, catch up on Voyager with us. It's fun. <laughs> we have opinions, a lot of them. So it's that's always fun and ranty. Yeah. And then uh, Fridays is Philosophize Friday, where I do literally whatever the fuck I want and claim that it's for the greater education of mankind. <laughs> so yeah it's mostly me ranting about stuff and sometimes reading my short stories and uh, sometimes just not actually doing a philosophized Friday because I've decided to be a lazy person because it was a rough week uh, <laughs> so yeah. that happens and it's important to uh, be able to uh, take a day off like that yeah. so sometimes I just don't want to and, and don't do that yeah. but uh, yeah uh, and our next podcast is uh, for this is going to be a guide to working with the Fae. Yeah, it's going to be Fae work. Yeah, stuff. we do a lot of work with the Fae folk in our home, and uh, we've got a lot of interesting uh, insights and, and opinions, opinions and about that. So yep, we'll be and we'll learn a little, and we'll learn that. some history, and we'll talk about that kind of stuff. So um, either way, I've been John. This has been Julie. We are. Um, uh, we're we're glad you we're glad you joined us. And, yeah, uh, thank you for listening to yeah. us or watching us yeah. wherever it is that you're seeing this. We plan on making more of these, and uh, we hope to hear from you. So reach out, say hi, you know, ask a question. Always, we're always willing to talk at somebody for a thing. But uh, yeah, uh, this has been the Horn and Cauldron Podcast, Podcast. and uh, we will catch you guys next time. Stay magical, yo. Yeah?